Hello and welcome to the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9 FM. I'm Paul Kretschmer. My guest today and tomorrow is Roger D. Blackwell, Ph.D., a man who was a successful lecturer at Ohio State University for many years, was involved in boards of directors for publicly traded companies, and who was convicted of insider trading, a charge he continues to deny. Well, I was born and died in the Missouri Ozarks. And the first chapter of this new book is about how you get born and then die. And actually, I died. I was a stillborn baby and without oxygen for 45 minutes. And uh, my mother and was just barely alive. And I had been all cut up. They tried to get me out with forceps and so forth. And my grandmother and my father was in the operating room in a little tiny country hospital, one doctor and one nurse for the whole hospital. And they pulled me out, and I was dead. So they laid me up on a shelf for 45 minutes where I was without oxygen. And um, after a while, my dad thought he saw a movement and picked me up, and he and my grandmother caressed my back, and I took a breath and began to uh, actually breathe. It was a couple of days before I made any sounds or so forth, but the doctor turned to my dad and said to him, that was a mistake because my head was elongated from the forceps pulling and all cut up, and I'd been without oxygen for 45 minutes. And the doctor said to my dad, you should have never done that. He'll be so brain damaged, that was a mistake. And so when I heard my dad telling the story many times, he would chuckle at me and say, so his mother and I always wondered how he would have turned out if he hadn't been brain damaged. Um, But actually, I was apparently not so brain damaged that I couldn't uh, get a job and get a Ph.D. eventually. And um, so that's what I did for 40 years, is teach 65,000 students at the Ohio State University. And you ask about how I met the correctional institutions. Um, I might read just a few sentences from Chapter 8 of the book that explains a little bit. Have you ever thought, I'm reading now, about how likely and I hope your listeners are thinking about this for themselves, how likely you are to be sent to prison for six years. What would you have to do for that to happen to you? As I rode silently on the passenger side of my car through the rolling Appalachian Mountains on a cold, rainy January morning in 2006, I thought silently how I might have answered that same question in the past. You could have asked me about most any dire consequence that could happen, and I would have considered it more likely than going to prison. Death in my family, a major medical problem for myself, those would have been likely for a person my age. Maybe even a financial reversal, but never in a thousand years would I have considered any possibility of going to prison. And the rest of the chapter is the circumstances that led to that. I was sentenced to 72 months, which is six years, and I spent that time in the Federal Correction Institution in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, And I know it's Christmas coming up for a lot of people. I thought they might be interested in what is it like to be in prison during Christmas. And I can tell you it's the saddest thing that can happen to you, one of the saddest things. It's the second saddest thing for me, because on Christmas Eve, in my first year in prison, I was sitting in the quiet room. <clears throat> one of the few places you get any quiet in a prison. And I was reading, I don't remember whether I was reading the Christmas story, maybe, or books by C.S. Lewis or Tim Keller that impacted me. And they came, two or three other guys, inmates, came in and said, Hey, Blackwell. Well, they called me, Hey, Professor. In the prison, everybody has a nickname. My nickname was the Professor. They said, Hey, Professor, this guy wants to become a Christian. Can you tell him how to do that? And so on Christmas Eve, my first Christmas in prison, I had the honor of helping to be an instrument of the Holy Spirit, of leading that man to Christ. And I thought, wow, what a Christmas gift. On Christmas Eve, to lead somebody to Christ. And that happened a number of many times during prison. But that was my first Christmas in prison. And so if your listeners are thinking about Christmas and they have an angel tree ministry in their church or something like that, I can tell you, for years before I went to prison, I had given gifts for angel tree, and I saw what that does to men who have no way of reaching their family, uh, very limited communications, and somebody goes 
and gives an angel tree gift of something to their family for an inmate. It's a wonderful thing, and I hope hope your listeners uh, think about that if they have the opportunity to do that. That's a very uh, wide-ranging uh, description of yourself and the circumstances uh, within which you have lived uh, at that point wh- while you were in prison for those uh, six years. Can you tell me what from your experience in the past professionally had anything to do with the fact that you ended up being charged with something and then ending up in jail as a result of a conviction? Well, the, uh, the, the specific crime I was charged with was insider trading because I was on the board of actually quite a few corporations, public corporations, and I had been on the board since I was 29, and now I'm 60-something then, and uh, I had I knew exactly what you can say and what you can't say. You cannot tell anybody to buy or sell stock. And my office manager asked me, why are you having extra board meetings at Worthington Foods, which is a health foods company, public company? And I said, well, I can't comment on any of my board meetings, but she bought some stock, she and her husband, in their IRA account. And prosecutors argued, well, you, you could have told her that. And she testified, no, he didn't. So they charged her with making a false statement and sentenced her to 27 months and her husband 24 months and me 72 months. There was no evidence or anything. And during the sentencing, the judge even said, now, there were no victims in this crime, but I want it to be a lesson so there can't be any restitution that I can ask for, but I'm going to sentence him a million dollars. And he did. And he was right. There were no victims because there really was no crime. Because if somebody buys stock, and my secretary did the same thing that 6,000 other people did the same time when the stock price fell, she bought more. She and her husband had, uh, that was their biggest holding in their account. They'd been buying it for years, but they bought more, and it happened to be at the same time that we were talking to Kellogg to sell the company. And, you know, I provide the details in, in, in the book, but I went from living a life that was as good as it can get, nice home, great job, 65,000 students and a lot of teaching awards and everything, to living in a prison, sleeping on a steel plate uh, with a, something they called a mattress, just a little cotton pad. And that's a big adjustment. Huge I adjustment, I would think. <laughs> Well, it's huge, but I didn't go there by myself. Uh, The same person who rescued me in that uh, operating room 65 years earlier was with me when I went to prison. And that's what I, that's the lesson I learned. Um, And I describe the fact that in in many cases, no one knows you're there. I've been in the Gaza Strip. In Israel, I've uh, been in Nablus at Jacob's Well, and all these things where I was in danger. Um, and I was mugged in South America by some guys with the knives, and, and uh, I, I, nobody knew I was there. Everybody thought I was there alone, but I wasn't alone. God was with me, and that's what I talk about in this new book called You Are Not Alone, and how I moved from atheism into becoming a Christian. You believe God spared your life in prison. Um, would you would you d- refer to yourself as having been impacted on an ongoing basis because you were convicted of a crime and sent to jail and serve your time? Is, is there still ramifications that come out of your experience that you feel will follow you for the rest of your days because because you went through that experience in the first place? Yes, in fact, uh, a felony conviction is a conviction for life. Uh, when I came, got out of prison, I talked to the dean where I'd been teaching, and she told me, she said, now all your teachers tell me about how much they liked you as a teacher, and I have no doubt about your qualifications, but I will not have a felon in the classroom, so you can't, you can't teach for us. And I didn't. Uh, I had to make a new life. This is the first of two interview sections with Roger D. Blackwell, Ph.D. on the WIHS Journal, discussing his book, You are not alone. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. 860-346-1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer on the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from WIHS.